Let us pray. Father, we thank you very much for this session we have now of Bible teaching. We know that the church becomes strong when the teaching of the word as a central place, I can speak what's place in the life of the believer, in the church of the living God, as well as in the ministry of the ministers of the church. We're praying, O oh Lord, that as we come into this teaching this morning, you teach us yourself. Reveal the truth to every heart. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. This morning, we are having the Bible teaching, and we are following a series on holiness. Already yesterday, you listened to the word, sanctification and holiness, or holiness and sanctification through Christ. Today, we're looking at the message, holiness and sanctification, the condition or sanctification and holiness, the condition. As you look at the Bible, you'll see that man had to learn very early that the provisions of the Lord and the privileges granted by God are conditional. From the very day of creation, Adam knew that if he was to have continued fellowship with God, and if he was to stay in the Garden of Eden, that was conditional. And the Lord right away, immediately, he brought him to that Garden of Eden after creation. He gave him that condition. Here is what to do. Here is what not to do. If you are going to remain alive, alive in God, alive in fellowship with the Lord, and in fellowship remaining in that provision of the Lord in the garden, his inability and unwillingness to keep that condition drove him and his wife out of the garden. And then, as the Lord himself brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And he promised them he was going to take them to the promised land. Again, he told them and he showed them that the escape out of the iron furnace is conditional. Here is what they will do. They will take the lamb, slay the lamb, apply the blood of the lamb on the condition of following strictly on what he had said, they'll escape the land of bondage. And then, as they went through the wilderness to get into the land of promise, again, everything was conditional. Conditioned on fully following God and accepting his word and accepting his will without debate, without disagreement without disobedience. That was the unwavering condition that the Lord gave them. And then the Lord established the priesthood. And Aaron the high priest learned in a very painful and hard way that the privilege of continued service to God was also conditional. And when those two priests, the sons of Aaron, when he brought in strange fire, Aaron learned in a very painful and hard way that continuation in the service of the Lord was conditional because he lost those two sons. And then the kingdom was established in Israel. Saul, the first king, also lost the kingdom when he refused to fulfill the condition. You come on to the New Testament now. And if you listen very well to the New Testament, 
If you read with understanding, with illumination of the spirit, if you read with the explanation, interpretation of the spirit of God upon your heart, while you read the New Testament, you will learn that being born again is conditional to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that you are born again, remaining as a member of God's family is also conditional. There is an if. There is a condition that you have to fulfill if you are going to remain a member of the family of God. Not only that in the New Testament, to be involved in the work of the Lord is also conditional. And then eventually to be accepted into heaven at last. That too is conditional. And if you're going to receive rewards for your service in God's kingdom, all these things we find are very much conditional. So then, you start from Genesis, from the entrance of the first man into the garden of Eden and you move on to the time of the priesthood and the time of the prophets and the time of the kings and to the time of the gospels the time of the Lord Jesus Christ and the time of the establishment of the church and you come unto the consummation of all things and you come unto revelation and all through from the beginning to the very end, the commencement to the consummation, you'll find that there were conditions to be fulfilled. And the centrality of that condition is holiness and sanctification. And that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at this important, indispensable condition that you cannot relegate to the background. We're looking at a condition that Almighty God Himself supervises and looks at, evaluates, examines to find out whether you and I were following the path He has laid down. Whether this condition, number one, the condition for service. Number two, the condition for abiding in the family of God. Number three, the condition for having reward for our service here on earth. Number four, the condition for eventually entering into those pearly gates, entering into heaven. Whatever it is, whether it's our salvation or whether it's our service whether it's being happy here in our fellowship with the Lord or happy there eternally in eternal unbroken uninterrupted fellowship with the almighty God whether here or there there is a condition and that condition is that your heart will be sanctified and your life will be holy in first second timothy chapter 2 second timothy chapter 2 verse 19 nevertheless the foundation of god standeth sure the foundations of men shake. The foundations of men are blown up out of their socket. The foundations of men are destroyed. They collapse after some time. Time has its toll upon the foundations of men. But... Nevertheless, 
the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Look up here. Nobody names the name of Christ more than the preacher, more than the minister, more than the one declaring the gospel of salvation, more than the one lifting of Christ. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Nobody names the name of Christ more than the one that comes to show us the way of salvation. Who comes to show that Christ is the way and is the life and is the truth. Nobody names the name of Christ more than you people here. And this is the foundation of God. And it has this seal. It has this time. It has this divine mark. Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Iniquity anytime, anywhere, of any size, of any shape, of any description, even the appearances of evil, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, in verse 20, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, precious things they are, but of wood, useless and worthless, of earth and of and some to honor, and some to dishonor. It says, in a great house. Paul, what do you mean by that? He says, I'm talking about the church already. I've told you in verse 19, the people that name the name of Christ. And when those people in the church, when they come in, they say, in Jesus' name. When they pray, they say, in Jesus' name. When they come up here, they say, praise the Lord. When they say anything, they say, Christ is on the throne. And they mention Christ, the members, and the ministers. It says, I'm talking about a church. And in a large church, in a big church, the people that name the name of Christ... In a large church like that, there are not only vessels of honor, but there are vessels to dishonor, wheat and tear. The loaf and the leaven, the good fish coming out of the sea, and the bad, which the fisherman goes to the riverside. And he throws the net in. And the net catches both the good and the bad. Paul the apostle says by inspiration that in this large house, there are vessels unto honor and there are vessels unto dishonor. And he says it's always been like that. In the land of Israel, there were the Caleb's and the Joshua's. And there were the Korahs, the Dathan, and the Abirams. In the time of the kings, there are the Jehoshaphats and the Ahabs. In the time of the prophets, there are the false, the Ananias, and the Jeremiah's too. And in the time of the disciples, there are the Johns and the Judas Iscariot's too. And in the time of the epistles, there are the Pauls and there are the Barnabas as well as the Demas too. And so, in a great house, there are vessels unto honor 
and are vessels unto this honor. Now, he comes to the condition. If we are going to be vessels unto honor in that large house, in that kingdom of God, in the service of the Lord, if we're not going to be part of the mixed multitude, and we're not going to be followers of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, if we're not going to be of the relatives of Achan, if we're not going to be of the descendants of Judas Iscariot and Demas, then he tells us in verse 21, in verse 21, if a man, you know the woman is included, if a man, he says, therefore, purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet suitable feet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. It tells us there that there is a condition, and the condition is if a man purge himself, purge himself from these. From what? Oh, Timothy understood. He got the first letter. And in the first letter, he learned that in the first chapter, there were people that were in false doctrine, trying to establish the Mosaic Jewish law again. If a man purge himself from that kind of Jewish law, going back to the Jewish law, if a man purge himself from this, in chapter 2 he learned that there were people that will not rightly divide the word of truth. And he, he also learned there were people that uh, will, will not follow after the word of the Lord and they will be in worldliness if a man purge himself from these. In chapter 3, didn't he learn of all those qualifications of the elder and of the bishop, of the overseer? And if a man purge himself from these... And then from chapter 1 of this second Timothy, he had been telling him to you the things that ought to be in the life of a minister and the things that ought not to be. If a man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet or suitable for the master's use. There you can find that there are conditions. If we are going to be useful in the kingdom of God, in the service of the Lord, there are conditions. And if you are eventually going to scale it through, and you are eventually going to leave the domain of service here, and go to the domain of the eternal kingdom. There is also a condition in Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Reading there verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand? In his holy place. And if he'd wanted to know, he knew already that there are conditions even here on earth. And so he knew there will be conditions over there if you're going to get to heaven eventually. And so David asked the question, he asked for himself, he asked for his own children and family. He asked for the land of Israel, the people of Israel, because he was a king over them. He asked for the whole world because he was a prophet. 
As a man and as an individual, he asks for himself, what does it take? I want to be there. As a father in the family, he asks for his children and family, what does it take? I want my children to be there. As a king in Israel, he asks for the land of Israel for his subjects, what does it take to get to heaven? As a prophet, he asks for the people of God, what will it take? Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? How I pray that the time will come in your life. When, like David, exalted to the highest level, seat, throne in the land. You know that that exaltation will not be forever. And that exaltation is nothing. If you do not have the exaltation of the Lord, eventually, I pray, the time will come in your life. When you search your personality aside, your position aside, your professions aside, and your popularity aside, and you come down from the throne. Because that is a temporary thing. And you come and you ask the Lord, Lord, what's the condition? What does it take? That I'll be able to enter into that place. What does it take? That I will abide in the eternal sanctuary of the Lord. What does it take? That I will eventually get into that place in my father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, behold, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you unto myself. So that where I am, there ye may be also. What's the condition that it will take me to be able to get to that place? Eventually, there comes that time in your life. There ought to come that time in your life when you stop everything. And the only thing that matters to you, the only thing you are thinking about is what is the condition that I'll be able to enter into that place eventually and finally, eternally to be with the Lord. And then the answer came. It's in verse 4. And in verse 4 it says, He that has clean hands. David understood. David understood. Because his hands were stained with blood. He didn't do it himself. He used another fellow to do it. But the Lord said... Even though you have not done it yourself, I saw the plot, I saw the plan, I saw the way it was carried out, I knew the hand that wrote the letter, and I know the sword that killed the man. David, you're thinking of, you're asking of, the one that will get over there eventually, he that has, raise up your hand. I don't sound clean. Touching people that are not your wives, not your husband. Writing letters and taking bribe. Fraud. Writing petitions that lie against your leaders. Those hands there, those hands there, those hands there. Are they clean? Hands. Hands that are not sticky, t touching, stealing church money. Hands, put them down. I hope they'll be clean before you go. Clean hands. And then it says, and a pure heart. Hearts washed, cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. Pure hearts. Blessed are the pure in heart.
for they shall see God. And so, as you look at the Bible, you will see that your relationship with God, your service in the kingdom of God, and your entrance eventually into that place prepared for prepared, purified people. It takes condition. There are three points we're going to quietly, slowly, systematically look at. You may not understand. In Lagos here now, what I do is, if I see that there are people who give me sign that they are in a hurry and they want us to finish in time, I turn their sign around and I prolong the message so as to teach them lesson that you sit on the pew there or you stand anywhere there, you are not the one to control the speaker here. And what we do here at the headquarters is that I do the opposite of what you want because I know you are not of the spirit if you are doing that. And so if I'm going to be of the spirit, I have to do the opposite of those who are not in the spirit. The more you are in a hurry and the more you are impatient, the more we are going to prolong the thing. Because I see, if you want it short, I, the signal it gives to me is that the Holy Ghost wants it long. And so I watch, and I'm trying to understand now the way of the Lord. Because the things that are highly esteemed among you, that is abomination in the sight of the Lord. And if you want it short, I know you are carnal, therefore I know the Holy Ghost wants it long. That's why you'll get what you want. And you'll get what you need also. Slowly and systematically, we're going to look at three points. Point number one. The criteria for acceptable and enduring service. The criteria for acceptable and enduring service. Number two, the characteristics of all who are entirely sanctified. The characteristics of all who are entirely sanctified. Number three, the condition for admission into God's eternal sanctuary. The condition for admission into God's eternal sanctuary. I come to point number one. The criteria for acceptance and enduring for acceptable and enduring service. In Isaiah chapter 52, Isaiah chapter 52. I'm reading there in verse 11. Isaiah 52, verse 11. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Can anything be clearer? Can anything be plainer? Can anything be more vividly described, stipulated in the word of God? It says, depart ye, depart ye, go out from this. He was telling them to go out of the gentle people around them that did not have the mark of the redeemed of the Lord. And he's telling us, all the people around us that behave, that act, and live their lives in a way that shows that they have not met the Redeemer. They have not been washed in the blood of the Lamb. They have not become new creatures in Christ. Their principles and policies and practices, they are of the world and they are not of God. 
It says, if you bear the vessel of the Lord, here is the criteria, here is the condition you need to fulfill. Depart ye, depart ye. What? Who is that talking to you? Ah, he's talking to everybody. Open your ears, open your ears, open your ears. He's talking to the people that are going to be involved in the service of the Lord. That if we are ushers, you're in, you're in the service of the Lord. If you are involved in the security of life and property in the church, you're in the service of the Lord. If you are music director, if you are a singer, if you are a musician, you are in the service of the Lord. And if you come on stage and you declare the word of the Lord and you proclaim the word and you preach the word, you are in the service of the Lord. And if you are a woman and uh, you are the wife of a leader, the wife of an overseer, you are in the service of the Lord. Listen. We have all those areas of work in the kingdoms of the world too. In the world, we have the people that put things in order, arrange things in public functions. And we have the people that keep property and life and territory in security in the kingdoms of the world too. We have musicians and singers in the world too. We have orators, speakers in the world too. Then it says when we do those same services in the church, Depart ye, depart ye. The methods of those same people in the world, you cannot practice it in the church. They are not born again. They do not know the Lord. And they are over the kingdoms of this world. And when you come into the church of the living God, although your service may have the same outward external description as the service of those people in the world, you cannot bring their practices and their policies and their principles and the perversions of those people, you cannot bring them into the church. When you come to work in the church, there is a condition. And the condition is that anything that's an appearance of evil that they practice in the world in that same area of service when you do that service in the church you cannot you cannot you will not you must not do it holiness and sanctification the condition if we're going to be in the service of the lord in first chronicles First Chronicles chapter 15. First Chronicles 15. Open your Bible. This Bible teaching is going to take time. In First Chronicles chapter 15 verse 2. Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God, but the Levites. For them as the Lord chose him to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him. David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place, which he had prepared for it. And David assembled the children of Aaron and the Levites in verse 12. And he said unto them, Ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark 
of the Lord God of Israel unto the place that I have prepared for it. Look up, please. You need to learn that rushing on, following on, quickly, hurriedly, finishing all the sin of the day without getting the sin that the Lord brought you here for, that will not do. You are not here just to, uh, you know, finish what you have in the booklet in your hand. You are here to say, Lord, why did I come to this Congress? What is that solitary, wonderful, important thing you want me to get? That's why you are here. What's the thing? That you brought me here for to turn my life, my understanding, my ministry, the church, to turn it around. That's why you came here. Listen. The people that were to carry a wooden box called the Ark of God that contained the Ten Commandments, they were not preaching it. They were not interpreting it at this time. They were not exposing it, expounding it to the children of Israel at this time. Only to carry it like we carry the Bible. Not preach, not announce, not pray, not do anything. Carry, carry, just carry. Those people that were to carry it. David said... You must sanctify yourself. If the people that carry the wooden box containing the commandments of the Lord, if they were to be holy and sanctified, if the people that lighted the candles in the synagogue, in the temple, in the tabernacle, only to put light, light, light. Just a physical light. Put on the light in the sanctuary. If they were to be holy and sanctified. If the people that were just to erect the tent, tabernacle, in the land of Israel. And put the stake there. And put the stake here. And put the pillar there. And put the peg here. If those people are to be sanctified and holy. What do you think of the people? The people that talk about the holy God. From the holy Bible. About his holy son. About the holy ghost. Showing us the holy path. The highway of holiness. Leading men into the holy heavens to have fellowship eternally with the holy angels. What do you think about the people that have the precious, peculiar, eternally blessed privilege of preaching the word of God to tell people about the way to heaven? If the people that carry ordinary wood, if they are to be holy, about the people that are here who are supposed to preach the word of course the condition of continued service in the kingdom of God is that will be holy and sanctified look at verse 13 and verse 14 for because Ye did it not at the first. The Lord our God made a breach upon us. For that we ought, we sought him not after the due order. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to do what? To bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. It shows very clearly then, very clearly then, that 
the criteria for being in this service of the Lord is that holiness and sanctification will be in our heart revealed demonstrated in our lives Malachi chapter 2 Malachi chapter 2 reading verses 6 and 7 Malachi 2 6 and 7 the law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his lips he walked with me in peace and equity and turned many away from iniquity that's our work that's what we are called to do to turn many away from iniquity for the priest's lips should keep knowledge and it shall seek the law at his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Then, if he's going to turn many away from iniquity, himself, in verse 6, the law of truth will be found in his mouth. Iniquity will not be found in him. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. See the kind of people that God used before the kind of people he still wants to use today. Second Peter chapter 1. Verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but, listen to this, holy men, not sinful men, holy men, not compromising men, holy men, not unrighteous men, holy men, not secret sinners. The people that sin, once they know that, the pastor will not know this. There are many people here. The things you do, if you knew that we would know that this is what you do, and this is why you do it, you will not do them. If we have the fear of God, we will not do anything that we just think up in our hearts that we know is not to see the light of the day. Anything that you know God will not approve of these. If you have the love of God, the honor for God, the respect for God, the fear of God, whether man will know or not, you know that by him, actions are weighed. He knows the spirit of man, and the heart of man, and the motive of man, and the actions of man. And if you have the fear of God in you, like these men that served the Lord and proclaim the eternal realities of the kingdom of God, the very word, the very mind, the very will of God. If you know you have this precious treasure in earthen vessels and you are to go and declare it and give it and be a faithful steward of the mysteries of the kingdom you will not do some of those things holy men holy men holy men of god and holy women women can you stand up all women
three women too. Let me let me tell you. If we find out that you women that you do not understand the privilege you have in bringing up women ministry in the church. That privilege, that service is conditioned on holiness and sanctification. If you don't understand that, all women keep on standing anywhere. I don't want any woman sitting down now. If you don't understand that the privilege of service in a church like this is given only on the condition that you are holy and sanctified. <laughs> the same person that God used to raise up that women ministry. If we see now that you have forgotten what brought you in, why you came in, and the holiness criteria, the holiness condition is no more there. Well, cancel this thing you call the women ministry. And uh, your leader knows me very well because we live together. She knows it doesn't cost me anything, even to blot out, cancel, wipe out. Even the women mirror itself. If that condition of holiness unto the Lord, abiding by the word of the Lord, if we find that is not there, I was going around this woman, I did this morning, and the woman there. I, I, I asked her, I said, from where are you? She told me. I said, are you married? She said, yes. I said, do you obey your husband? She said, yes. I said, look up at me here. I said, obey me then. If you obey your husband, I'm older than your husband. Here is your pilot to lead you to that heavenly place. And it's the call of God. And you women, the condition that brought you into ministry in this church is obedience to the word of God. And uh, you need to understand that that is the condition of continued service. And if we see that you women are not here to help us build up the church, we thought you are going to help us build up. And so we allowed you to have your women mirror, allowed you to have, uh, you know, women fellowship once a month, and allowed you to have all these women conferences. Oh, you think I have time <laughs> running about? Coming to women conference here, women conference here, women conference there. We thought we we're going to, you know, give you the holiness message. So that if you have the holiness message, you will influence the other women. You may be surprised we come to the next uh, conference or congress and there is no section for a uh, women leaders meeting in halls 8, 9, and 10. You don't know what you have while you have it. When it is taken away from you, that's when you realize that uh, you ought to be under authority and under obedience to the word of God. And when your women mirror doesn't come to you and will fold up everything, it's then you'll wake up and understand that women mirror is conditioned on holiness. If the holiness is not there, you're going to miss the privilege of service. And so, you can sit down, I hope you get the point. And I hope that you show that you really get the point. Many of you, the majority of you perhaps, I'm old enough to be your father. 
So, we need to understand that this holiness condition is what we are standing upon and it says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Therefore, the criteria, the condition of our continuing service, enduring service unto the Lord is holiness of heart, holiness of life. And, and you've seen it yourself in Psalm 101. Psalm 101, reading there in verse 6. Psalm 101, verse 6. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. You've seen it then very clearly. It's so clear in the word of God that the criteria for acceptable and daring service is holiness and sanctification. I go to point number two slowly this morning. The characteristics of all who are entirely sanctified. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Reading from verse 10. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 10. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth. As it is in heaven. The holy angels of God. They do the will of God in heaven. And then Jesus said, we should learn to pray. And what prayer do we pray? Thy will be done in the earth as it is done in heaven. The marks, the evidence of sanctified heart and life is the very fact that you become submissive to the revealed will of God. Your will will not be allowed to protest against the will of God or to resist the will of God in any way, you'll be so ready to do the will of God as angels do it in heaven. And you will not allow any man to compete or the authority of God in your life or to rival the authority of God in your life. You'll be willing to do the will of God promptly, without question, in spite of your flesh, in spite of the world, in spite of Satan, in spite of pain or persecution. When self is truly crucified, and Christ reigns on his throne without any rival. And Christ is all in all. That's a sanctified life. And it is then that you are ready to do everything the Lord wants you to do. If he wants you to be a district pastor, praise the Lord. If he wants you to be a region overseer, praise the Lord. Sometimes uh, the people that do not know the will of God, uh, they fight, they fight against the will of God. But thank God we still have some people here who accept the will of God. Our present uh, church secretary was a state overseer. And he, he might have been the first or one of the first state overseers. And he's been sent on short-term mission. He's been sent to do this. He's been sent to do that. He's been sent almost all over the country. Go and help me supervise that. Go and help me supervise that. Go and help me put that in place, in that other place. And he's uh, been one of a uh, very effective and dependable state of overseers. And eventually, I, uh, the Lord led me to call him. And I said, my brother, 
How are you? What I meant is, are you still there? Like I know you are there. How are you? Are you still in that will of God? Submissive to the will of God as you are ever. How are you? Are you still ready? No matter what it is to do it. And he said, I'm fine. I'm all right. I'm still the way I was. I still believe in the leading of the Lord through the leadership. I said, what if the leading takes you away from being a state overseer, even not a region overseer, and from overseeing anything, and gets you into an office and locks you up in an office, and you begin to shuffle papers, and you do administrative work, and you are no more an overseer organizing retreat, organizing conferences, and getting money for mission, and being in charge of this, and being in charge of that, and we just lock you up into that office, and look into this administrative work. He smiled, he said, the will of the Lord be done. So I said the will of the Lord is leave the state work you are doing and come and be the, uh, the church secretary over here. And I said will you pray and you know maybe you discuss with your family, your wife or nothing like that. The will of God is the will of God. I just need to go back home and inform them, pack my load. Do I come this week? I said no, I even give you till next month. And he's now in Lagos. I'm telling you the will of God. When you are sanctified, you are ready for the will of God. Wherever that will of God will take you. But the people that say, this is the only thing I will do. If the will of God tells me anything I don't like. Anything I was not expecting. A way with the will of God. That's not sanctification. Sanctification is when that thing comes to you. When his message comes to you. There is but one thing to do. Just obey. Just obey. If a mansion's high your side. In that land beyond the sky. Though the way you may not see. Yet faith and duty will cry. Just obey. If you are in the will of God, if you are in the Savior's hand, you must do as he commands. You cannot say him no, because this is the Lord of your life, this is the one that saved you, and this is the one that you say has sanctified you. All that you will do is just obey. Just obey. It's the way. God's way. When that message, and it's still coming today, when it comes into your heart, there is but one thing you do. For the people that are saved, for the people that are sanctified, for the people that are following the way of the Lord, just obey. That's the word of the Lord. But you know, it is fighting against the word of God. It is fighting against the will of God. How can they tell me to do that? Sanctification doesn't argue with God. Sanctification doesn't push the will of God. The mind of God. The revelation of God. The conviction of the Holy Read. Consecration. Sanctification. Surrender. Yieldedness to God. Will not push the will of God aside. They will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live. By the face of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. When self is crucified, and self or society does not have the gravitational pull over your life, anymore. For those who may not have scientific background, gravitational pull, when you throw something up, it comes down always. It's the force of gravity that brings it down. That's what we call gravitational pull. And seen with society, they have the tendency of having gravitational pull on people that when they want to go up, come up higher, come up higher, come up higher. There's always a gravitational pull of seen and seen and society bringing them down. The people who are sanctified, 
that kind of gravitational pull is no more there. They are free to obey the Lord, to serve the Lord all the days of their lives. And then he tells us in Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, in your heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I'll give you a heart of flesh. Can you look up here, please? Please. Why should we hurry over this? Why should we be in a hurry and not stay here? I will give you an heart of flesh. I will take away the stony heart. We are witnesses in our regions, in our states. The state of Asia, the region of Asia, stands up, declares the word of God. And it sets things in order. Sister, sit down there. Brother, sit down there. Young fellow, what are you doing there? Sit down there. Child, sit down there. Parents, put your child by your side. Let's have church. Five minutes after the state overseer said that, exactly the opposite of, this, of what the state overseer or national overseer says, the people who heard will do the opposite immediately. If that is not Tony Hart, tell me what Tony Hart is. Here in this church, Lagos, during the December retreat, all the announcements I made during the messages, they were inside the cassette. And the, the cassettes came to you in your regions and states and nations. The orderliness are taught to be in the house of God. The submission that children of God ought to demonstrate. We distributed it all around. You listened. It's not one month yet. December 22nd to 26th. Or December 27th for the nations to January 1st. Not up to one month yet. Here you come. All those things that were corrected. Simple, simple, simple things. Not up to one month. You're already demonstrating them. If that is not Stony Heart, tell me what is Stony Heart. We start our ushers here. Because ushers are to help the church and the pastor to let there be orderliness while the pastor is declaring the word where to work hand in hand security they to work hand in hand with their father in the lord choir they to work hand in hand with the pastor and sing before the message to inspire the preacher to prepare the congregation who they know they won't do it. And the things they know in their hearts 
the pastor will not like this. That's exactly what they do. If that is not stony heart, Bible students, what is stony heart? The young people, children, teenagers, the one that came from inside us, small, small children. And I told them here in Lagos, some of them in the youth choir, one of them at least, I taught her own father, the father may be here today, in the university. The children whose parents I taught in secondary school and university, those children in the youth choir will tell them, this is what to do. And these children, they have, we cannot call it courage. Courage is to obey the Lord. We cannot call it boldness. Boldness is to obey the Lord. They have whatever it is in the head and in the heart. Stone. That they will not do what the pastor says, what we read to them in the word of God. And they think that they are singing is so important that we cannot do without their singing. Uh -uh. Be before we got married, before their mothers got pregnant, before those children were born, before they knew how to talk, before they knew how to crawl, before they knew how to go to primary school, before they knew the uh, notation, staff notation of the music, before they knew how to sing, before they knew what is sulfur and alto and tenor and bass, were we not having church before their parents even came to the church? Were we not even having church? If we correct people and we say, here is what you do so that the worship of the Lord can be beautiful. And then you stand up like a Kora, a Desa, and a Baira. What is that? That's a stony heart. When you get to that level, in the church, no matter who you are. When you get to that level where the word of God doesn't reach you anymore. Where the word of God doesn't touch you anymore. You've gone far. For you to come back is going to take the grace of God. That's why, listen, whatever you are going to do, you want to show the demonstration of stony heart again? Go ahead. The youth choir in Lagos, in all the regions, in all the states, in all the nations in Africa, are now restricted to the youth Bible study, youth meetings to sing. For now, the youth choir will not sing in any Sunday service, in any adult retreat, in any adult meeting. And you use the workers who are there. If you have the stone in your head, and a stone in your heart, and a stone on your tongue, and a stone everywhere, you want to demonstrate it, you are going to give that youth choir perpetually away from the adult church. We cannot have anyone, any group of people, no matter their talent, no matter their singing ability, we cannot have anyone that will not show the evidence of sanctification and holiness come on our platform here and come and minister to us. And for what we see, we're going to set this house in order. Before we continue, just singing, singing, singing. Even the adult choir here. 
they know, as I know, uh, that I'm still watching them. We carried out an interview before the Congress and the people that were recommended, there were 334. In the past, I said, that's all right. They were interviewed. Those people are recommended. Let them go and sing. I went through all the forms by myself again. And out of the 334, I was only able to get 117. Those are the people that came. Even in between that time, there's another one. We have removed the remaining 116. I was serious about this thing. The point is, as we have been doing this systematically at the headquarters church here, wanting to see when we're going to be free from the stony heart. I still see the increased demonstration of the stony heart. It's like they are saying, do what you want. Organize the way you want to organize. The rest of us remaining, we're not all right too. We also still have stony hearts. We are here. Every, everybody is praying for me, for my life to be long. Long enough to restructure. Long enough to reorganize. Long enough to disorganize. If I need to, pull everything down before you begin to build again. Jeremiah, I've given you a ministry to pull down, to tear down, and then to begin to build up. It's a ministry. If the stony heart is there. And we are not going to show that the marks of sanctification ought to be demonstrated in the house of the living God. We'll take the ministry, concentrate for the moment on the ministry of tearing down and pulling down before, then when everything is all right, then we now start the other ministry of building up. The point is this. The mark of sanctification is that that stubbornness that headiness that self will that says I will not obey the Lord I will not obey leadership I will not submit the Lord wants to take it away that's the mark in your heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you an heart of flesh. You see there the characteristics of those who are entirely sanctified. I come to point number three. The condition of admission into God's eternal Sanctuary. The condition of admission or for admission into God's eternal sanctuary in Psalm 15. Open your Bible. We need to study. Psalm 15, reading from verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness. And you see here again, the description here is not talent, it's not skill, it's not knowledge, it's not fame. It's not popularity. He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned. But he honors them that fear the Lord. That's the condition of getting to heaven. You honor the people that love and honor and fear the Lord. He that sweareth his own heart 
and changes not. You, you make a decision, you make a consecration, you're going to follow the Lord. And even when that consecration to follow the Lord and be to be submissive to his will becomes inconvenient to you, he changes not. He that putteth not out is money to usury. Nor taketh up reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. In Isaiah chapter 33, Isaiah chapter 33, from verse 15. Isaiah 33, verse 15. He that walketh righteously, speaketh uprightly. Be mentioning your life, your lifestyle, with what we're reading. He that despises the gain of oppression. That shaketh his hands from holding up bribes. That stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood. Shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. He that he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of the rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. Then eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. You see there? That's the condition for admission into the sanctuary of God, into heaven. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 14. Follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Follow peace with all men. I hope you understand. <laughs> because the false prophets are quick to take scripture, throw it at us when we oppose false doctrine and those uh, people in false doctrine they're quick to say follow peace with all men my friend that's not what it means jesus didn't follow peace with the pharisees and surrender his sound doctrine and take the traditions of men that the pharisees wanted you know, sometimes backsliders, they're very quick to throw the scriptures at us. Somebody has committed adultery and fornication, and we preachers, we come up here and, and we lash him out and expose him before the congregation, and somebody is going to say, Pastor, follow peace with all men. That's not what it says. Joshua was not following peace with Achan. What it means is this, in your living together, in your interactions together, neighbors, co-tenants, follow peace with all men. It doesn't mean that if you are destroying the church, pulling down the doctrines of the church, the pillars of the church, then you throw scriptures at us, follow peace with all men. No. Can we follow peace with you when you are disturbing people's salvation? It says, Paul the Apostle said, We didn't give them any space, not an hour. We're firm against false doctrine. We're firm against anyone bringing sin and rebellion into the church. We're firm. But follow peace with your neighbors, husband and wife. Follow peace with all men and Holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. That's what the Lord is saying. That you'll be pure in heart. In Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 8. In Matthew 5, 8. Here it says, Blessed are the pure in heart. 
For they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. Only those people that are pure in heart through and through. The blood of Jesus washing them, cleansing them, purifying them, and they remain pure until the coming of the Lord. Those are the people that will see God. And if you believe that Christ can come at any time, and if you believe that it shall not profit you anything to gain the whole world and lose your soul, then you ought to understand if there is any time to seek for that holiness, to seek for that purity, and to demonstrate that holiness and purity, it is now. We will listen to the message on holiness and sanctification through Christ yesterday. Listening to a message like that, I, I would have thought that immediately after that message, all through yesterday, you will see holiness everywhere. In attitude, in action, in appearance, in movement, in uh, interaction, in relationship, in prayer, in, or in the hostel, in the dormitory, in the cafeteria. Among the people, I, I thought, after hearing a message like that, holiness and sanctification through Christ, I thought, you'll just see the holiness everywhere. It will pervade the air. Everybody will even say, praise the Lord. I feel feel it, I sense it, I see it, and I, I appreciate it, I'm a partaker of it. I didn't see anything change. The same rebellion I saw before that message, I saw the same rebellion after. The same incorrigible attitude I saw before that message, I saw it after. How are we going to get to heaven if the only instrument, the only tool, the only message, the only thing that will get us there, we, we, we neglect it, we reject it, we throw it away. If in a place like this, where you hear it, and at the moment you hear it, immediately you hear it, it doesn't have any impact, any effect, what will happen in the house when you go, go back home? And on the day when the rapture will take place, that rapture can meet you on the point of your rebellion, on the point of your stubbornness, on the point of your righteous, unholy, unsanctified attitude. And then the saints of God, not sinners, the saints go marching in and we are gone. And you are still there. You don't have too much time left. The trumpet is about to sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise. And those who are alive in Christ, the wise virgins, they'll go with the Lord. For the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat, certificates and everything. The earth also. And the works that are therein shall be burnt up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and esteem unto the coming day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, Seeing that all, the, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in him, in peace, without spot, and blameless. Son of man, I have made you a watchman 
over the house of Israel. Hear the watch at my mouth. And give them warning from me. If thou speakest to warn the wicked of his way, and he turns, and he turns, and repents, he will leave. And thou hast saved thy soul. But, when I say to the wicked, Thou shalt die. And thou refusest to give him warning. He shall die. In his iniquity. But. You have saved yourself. Friends. Ministers. Deeper life workers. Here this morning, I am pure from your blood. I've told you, it's now in your hand. Take it, get to heaven. Refuse it, it's between you and God. Let's rise up and pray.